Hello and thank you for joining me today. This is Corey from the Box Scholar YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to talk about uh, Friedrich Bergmuller's problematic and controversial tempo marks, his metronome marks, in his 25 Easy and Progressive Studies, Opus 100. It's a, it's a difficult issue, and I want to address this issue in this video. Uh, I haven't planned this video out. I'm improvising, so this might go a little long. So you might want to get your cup of coffee or tea or whatever, sit back and uh, learn a little about uh, the problem and the solutions that I found for these problematic tempo marks in Bergmuller's um, opus. Also, I wanted to point out uh, that, or just remind you that my wife Marilyn and I are still uh, making a waiting list for summer, summer piano lessons. So if you're interested in starting piano in the summer, and you can continue on if you'd like into the fall. This is not just summer lessons, but it's lessons that we will begin in the summer, uh, because especially Maryland is on a tight schedule right now, and around May or the beginning of June, um, she'll, be, she'll free up her schedule to take on uh, several new students in the summer. I as well. Um, although my, my schedule is a little more lax because I'm doing more things like these videos and things like this. Also, uh, you're welcome to go to the Well-Rounded Pianist, check it out. This is where you can learn piano online with the help of my videos. I usually upload new content weekly. Okay, let's get to the topic on hand. And it is the uh, controversial tempo marks in Bergmuller's uh, opus here, opus 100. So to, to first start this, I want to uh, do a little advertisement for a book that I recently published uh, under Box Scholar Publishing. I own my own publishing company. This is Schumann's very famous Kinderzähnen, or the Scenes from Childhood, Opus 15. Now, if you don't have this, I would highly recommend buying this, either in the uh, PDF form, you can get that directly from my Box Scholar site, or the hard copy from Subito Music Corporation. I have a link below this video where you can get this. The reason why I'm bringing up this book, the Schumann, before we talk about the Bergmuller, is that Schumann, the, the tempo marks in Schumann's Kinderzähnen, which come from Schumann himself, presumably, are also problematic, just like the Bergmuller ones. And if you turn to the uh, preface here, a little introduction, I have about a three and a half to four page essay on my explanation of the problematic metronome marks in the Kindred Sane and, and, and what, the, what my solution is for that. To make a long story short, virtually every metronome mark is incorrect. And also in the Bergmuller, virtually every metronome mark is incorrect. And I will go over why those are incorrect and why it is easy to see that they're incorrect. And I will provide solutions on, on how, to, how to deal with these problematic metronome marks. Teachers don't know how to answer students when students say, well, I, I'm trying to play at this metronome mark and it's just way too fast. So what do I do? And the teacher might say, well, just try harder because this is the correct tempo because Schumann or Bergmuller indicated this tempo with the metronome. They're great composers. They, they used metronome marks. They were among the first, some of the, the first generation of composers in the 1800s to use actual metronome marks from the new metronome that was invented in the 1820s. So they can't be wrong, right? Because they're great composers. Great composers can never do anything wrong, right? Wrong, <laughs> wrong, totally wrong. Great composers can make mistakes. Great composers are not infallible with everything they do. So my job as an analyst and a pianist and a theorist is to unravel these mysteries of why do they mark these metronome marks if they're too fast or too hard to play? Okay, so once again, you need to get this and read this if you haven't, but 
in this video, I'm going to try to summarize, uh, sort of paraphrase or summarize what I say in this uh, preface here in my Schumann book. Okay, so if you look through the Bergmuller uh, Opus 100 pieces, you see these very, very fast metronome marks. The fastest ones being, I think, in the 150s, maybe 160s. I think the first one is 152. No, 176, I think, is the fastest one of all. So the fastest metronome mark is 176. That's like on number seven. And uh, there are some slower ones here, maybe in the 50s or so, but generally speaking, they're pretty fast. And why, why would you mark those? Okay, let's go uh, to a little detour here. I am going to uh, pick up a book. I, I just went to our bookshelf out here and I picked up just any old random book, New York City Landmarks. So let's say I buy this book in the bookstore Oh, great, we're gonna visit New York City. Let's learn about New York's landmarks. We buy this book. Let's say I open this book, and it says on the first page, just like the metronome mark. It says on the first page here, or the little leaflet here, it says, this book must be read at 100 words per minute what would you think? I mean, what would you think if you saw that in a book? Somebody actually telling you how fast you have to read the book. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. If it said, if it said that, you, you'd be mad. You'd be, who are they to tell me how fast I want to read this book? I mean, I can read this book any speed I want. Why do I have to read 100 words per minute? But this is the author's note. The author himself said, you have to read this in 100 words per minute. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Well, no. Nobody would ever do that with a book because they realize everybody's different. Everybody reads at different speeds. Not everybody is a speed reader. There are some people who read very slowly. Like, I'm, I'm actually a pretty slow reader, believe it or not. My wife is like, she can read twice as fast as me. Like, if we have to read something, like, it, it takes, I'm, I'm only halfway through, and my wife is already done. It, it's amazing. I, I don't know, I just don't know how my wife reads so quickly. I'm, I am a slow reader, believe it or not, for somebody of my caliber on the piano and being a scholar. I'm ju I just, I like to read slower. So if I saw you, you know, um, attention, you must read this book at 100 words per minute. I would, I would be furious. I would probably take the book back and complain and I'd probably try to find the author's email and chew them out. I'd say, what are you doing telling us how fast we have to read this book? I mean, I can read this book at any speed I want. Doesn't every, everyone read at different speeds? Why do we have to conform to some sort of ideal of, of reading a book? Another analogy, you're starting to get the point, but let me give one more analogy here. Let's say you're jogging. Let's say you want to get into shape. You go out the door, you do a little slow jogging down the street, you know, you're just, just uh, you know, enjoying your little jog down the street. Somebody comes down, they roll down their window in the car, and they look out, and they say, they tell you, hey, mister, you're jogging too slowly. You need to go faster because I read the best speed for jogging is so-and-so, and they have their best speed for jogging. So let's say somebody came up with a best speed for jogging for everyone on the planet. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense because everyone jogs at different speeds. Everyone is in different stages of life. Not everyone can jog the same speed as everyone else. So, okay, you're getting the point. So <laughs> you're, you're seeing where I'm going here, okay? Let's open up Bergmuller's book. You see, on the first number one, it says quarter note equals 152. That is the same. And the same thing is telling you 
you must read this book at 100 words per minute because there is an ideal speed to read books or novels at there, there's a, there's an ideal speed you have to do that or else you're wrong so basically the the impression i get with piano students and even piano teachers is that when they see this 152 on on number one they think oh oh my god we have to play 152 because Bert Mueller said so. We have to play 152 because Bert Mueller said so. Okay, let's try 152. All right, let's put it on 152. Here we go. All right. That's doable. I can play it at 152. Fine. If a student played that for me at any level, I don't care how good they are, I would say that's too fast. That is just too fast for this particular piece. Anyone would agree with that. Virtually anyone. Almost any piano teacher would say that's just too fast. Well, then why did he mark 152? The reason is that I am convinced that in the first generation of composers that began to use the metronome in the 1820s and 1830s, they were following Meltzel's advice. Meltzel was the man who invented the metronome. And Meltzel was in, an inventor. He was an amateur musician, but he was not a professional musician. He was not a concert pianist. He was not a concert conductor, I don't think. He was an inventor, first and foremost. And he was an amateur musician with an interest in music. And he was good. I think he, he and Beethoven knew each other. And Beethoven was probably the first famous composer to use metronome marks in his music. And Beethoven's metronome marks are controversial as well, and this theory of mine also applies to Beethoven's metronome marks. And here's the theory. It's not my own theory, by the way. If you want to learn more about this theory, you can go right over to the YouTube channel Authentic Sound uh, by uh, Vim Vinters. I, I hope that I, I pronounced that correctly. Vim Vinters. Uh, Vim Vinters has this theory that that 152 was actually half of that, which would be 76. So Vim Vinters argues that, I'm gonna put it on 76, okay? So I have it on 76 here. So 76 is half of 152. So, so basically, what Vin Vinters argues is that it really should be like this. Like that, actually half speed. And Mr. Winters uh, applies this theory to virtually all the composers and all the music from about you know, 1800 to 1850, or even later than that. I think that that's a huge, huge mistake on his part. I, I, I do believe that Mr. Winter's initial premise is correct. I do believe that the first, many of the first composers who, who began to use the metronome used it in a different way. So when it says 152, let me put it on 152 again. When I put it on one, it says quarter note is 152. So Mr. Winters argues that, that instead of that, you have So it, 152 is basically a, a subdivision of the larger beat. And so they thought in subdivisions rather than larger beats. So to just sum that up, 
basically you would take any any of these metronome marks that Bergmuller has and just cut it in half, and that would be the modern quarter note B. I disagree with that. Okay, I do agree with the premise that they used the metronome differently then than they do now. And there was a change somewhere, I'm not sure when, somewhere in the mid 1800s or so, most composers started to use the metronome in a different fashion, the way that we use it today with large beats. But I do agree with, I, I'm in 100% agreement with Mr. Winters on this one here, that, that the, this uh, double beat system or the, or the whole beat metronome practice, as he calls it, was, was the system that most of these early uh, generation composers used in the, in the early romantic generation. Bergmuller, Schumann, Beethoven, uh, maybe other, Kulau, maybe, I don't know, other composers. There is, there's a problem though, and there's a big, huge problem with, with this. First of all, you have to consider the metronome. When Meltzel invented the metronome in the 1820s, not sure the exact date, I think it says in my Schumann book, when he invented the metronome, the, the range was only, the, the slowest you could go was 50, and the fastest you could go was uh, 160. 50 to 160. Our modern metronome, like this, goes 40 is the slowest, and uh, 208 is the fastest. So, okay, so Beethoven's metronome. Beethoven was the first, one of the first composers to use the metronome. Beethoven's metronome that he used was, was the older kind. Beethoven, the, so the slowest speed on Beethoven's metronome was 50. It wasn't 40. And the fastest speed on Beethoven's metronome was 160. It wasn't 208. The same with Schumann. You can tell by the, by the speeds they give. Because the fastest speed Schumann, get, or Schumann gives is 138. And that's sort of almost at that 160 limit. Had it been, had, had he had one of the more modern metronomes that it was sort of like the second model that Meltzel made where he expanded the range. But here's another thing. Here's, here's one of the points. One of the points I make in my Schumann intro is that if, the, uh, if Meltzel's first prototype and his first production of metronomes was good and, and it, it enabled composers to mark exactly the speeds they wanted, if that's true, then what was the reason for him to expanding the, the range to, from, from 50 to 160 to 40 to 208. Okay, so if everything was nice and easy and hunky-dory for this range, what was the reason for expanding the range? There, there, was, there would have had to have been a reason. And the obvious reason is because he probably realized, well, that's too limiting. It's hard. What if you want what if 50 is the slowest speed, but what if the composer wants 40 or 42? They can't do it. Or what if he wants something faster than 160? What if he wants like 192? Well, he can't mark 190. He can't do 192 because he can only go to 160. So I believe that, that the ranges were expanded on the metronome to what we have today on our modern sort of metronomes like this, not on our phone, our phone apps can do everything, but on this modern type of metronome here, he, he may also expanded the range or whoever expanded it, I don't know, maybe it was somebody else that worked for Meltzel that decided, okay, we're gonna expand the range for metronomes to 40 to 208 instead of 50 to 160. And they did that in order to give composers more freedom to have more of a range that they could notate their tempos in. But that's still not good enough. That is still not good enough. 40 to 208 is very limiting. 
Here's another problem, another and probably the most glaring problem of all with Meltzel's new metronome was that if you read Meltzel's directions, his instructions on how to use the metronome for composers, he, there's only one option and that's in, you subdivide into two. So if you take 152, you know, cut that in half, it, our modern tempo would be 76. Well, what if, um, what if, what if it's in triple meter, like three, four or three, eight? Well, there's a big problem because triple meters can't be subdivided into two. You have to either go into three or one large B. Let me, let me give you an example. I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play a minuet here, a nice Bach minuet that everybody knows. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put the metronome on 108, 108, okay? times 108 okay so let's say I'm in early let's say I'm Beethoven and I want to indicate a tempo for that minuet in three four time well Meltzel's already given directions on how to do everything for four four two four everything in twos but Meltzel of course not being a professional musician forgot all about threes there's nothing anywhere that explains how to use this for triple meters. So you know what they did, or what Mr. Winters believed they did, was instead of going, well, you can't go 108 divided by three, that's 36, which would be too slow, so you can't indicate that. So they couldn't indicate uh, Beethoven, if you were Beethoven, were indicating a tempo for this minuet. He, he couldn't go quarter note equals 108 because Meltzel said, well, you have to indicate the large B or, or the large B in two. So the only option, it can't be 36, so it has to be 54. It has to be half of 108, which is 54. Okay, 54, uh, which is just a little bit faster than the slowest speed on Beethoven's metronome. So, so you see the problem is what what if what if I wanted okay let, let me I'm ahead of myself here okay let me put it on I'm gonna put it on 54 okay so what Meltzel was saying to do and what Mr. Winters says you have to do is you take half of the quarter note speed on a triple meter like 54 instead of 108 and then that goes like you have to play like a polyrhythm. So it would be. That, that's just crazy. A beginning pianist to do this. Ask an intermediate level pianist to do, they, to do They can't do this because they can't hear polyrhythms like that. So Mr. Winters believes that Meltzel was explaining how to use this metronome in this fashion. So if you have triple meters, you basically have to take that, you have to take that, that B to put it in modern perspective. You have to take that B and cut it in half and do a polyrhythm. And it's just crazy. It's just crazy. You can't do it. So let's say it's slower than that. Let's say, let's say Beethoven wanted to mark that that minuet at 96 instead of 108, okay? So. Okay, so 96. So let's take, um, let's take, okay, if I were to mark that in just one large beat, like, that would be 32 which is impossible because it doesn't, the metronome doesn't go to 32. Well, if I take half of 96, it's your, Beethoven couldn't do that either because it, it's 48. So let's put it on 48. So remember that Beethoven's slowest speed was 50. So if Beethoven wanted to mark this menu, a speed for this minuet, he couldn't do it. It's impossible. 
using Meltzel's directions on how to use the metronome. So here's 40A. That would be what Mr. Winters believes that they would have done back then, and I believe this is just not right at all. Anybody knows that's not right. The students can't do that. That's too complicated for them. So to make a long story short, Meltzel forgot all about threes. He forgot all about triple meters. So Meltzel's instructions on how to use his metronome, which were, was followed by Beethoven, Beethoven followed his instructions. It doesn't work for anything in triple meter or like a fast triple meter generally or uh, pieces in compound triple meter. It doesn't work for that either. It only works for pieces in 4-4 four, four, or 2-4 time that are sort of with tempos sort of in the middle area. You can't mark like slows or fasts because you, the metronome doesn't go to those extremes, you see? So the, basically, the, the metronome was a flawed device. It was flawed. It was not, it, was, it hadn't been fully developed yet. It was flawed. Meltzel's instructions on how to use this metronome was totally flawed because they, he totally forgot about triple meters and anything having to do with threes. Everything is only divisible by twos. I mean, you basically have to have a PhD in mathematics to figure this stuff out. But yet, here is Wim Winters on Authentic Sound saying, okay, everything has to be half speed. That is absolute hogwash. It's not half speed, but then it's not full speed either. Here's my theory. My theory is that um, either Bergmuller or his publisher put these metronome marks in here and they just tried their best at putting uh, a doable metronome speed for intermediate level piano students because these, this is not advanced stuff. This is for piano students who can't play very well yet. Why would they ever mark something that's really fast, like really, really fast for something for beginners? They wouldn't do that. So, so I believe it is half the, you, you can basically just take half the speed of, that they say in here. And I found that most of them work ideally at about three quarters. So if you, if you take 152, you go, down, you go down to 76, which is too slow for the first one. And then you just go, you go up another, like about uh, 25%. It'll, it'll bring you about maybe to 108 or so. So 108, 108. Perfect. That's a, that's a really good speed for number one, 108. So it's not, it's not half speed as Mr. Winters says, and it's not full speed either, as so one would one would believe if they took it literally. You see? So so it's neither half speed nor full speed. It's somewhere in between those. And I found that to be the case in all of Schumann's pieces, all of Bergmuller's pieces, and any of the early composers that used metronome marks because they were following uh, Meltzel's flawed, flawed instructions and his flawed mechanical device, not to mention the fact that you have to wind it up. It kind of gets slower as, as you're going along. You, it's really very hard to use one of these devices. We take it for granted, but one of these devices in the 1820s or 1830s was like, it, it, it was like trying to, it would be like for, for a beginner, uh, like using a cell phone in the early 2000s, okay? It, it was like, you didn't know what to do with it. It's cell phones, nobody ever used cell phones. Now they're all experts at cell phones because they've had them, you know, for a couple decades. But, so you have to realize that the first generation of composers and pianists who tried to use metronomes 
we're, we're not experienced at using metronomes, or flawed devices, and Meltzel uh, didn't know what he was doing when he tried to explain how to use his metronome. So there's a lot going into this. It was a new technology. Nobody knew how to use it very well. Meltzel just didn't know how to explain it very well because he was not a professional musician. He was an inventor. And it was this mechanical contraption that you had to wind up and it would get slower. It's just not, it's not, not, not good. It's not optimal at all. And to top this off, let me just full circle back to the beginning. My, my, my uh, whole point that I made in the beginning of this video is that tempo marks, even, even if we could find out, even if, even if Bird Mueller came alive today and told us, I want this exactly at 108, you know, like the tempo that I believe it should be. Even if Bird Mueller came back to life and says, this should be 108, that still wouldn't be the correct speed for everyone who plays this piece. Just like reading a book at 100 beats per minute is not necessarily correct for everyone because everyone reads at different speeds. So I hope that this has sort of made you think a little bit about metronome marks. Here's my general rule for metronome marks. And you, this is radical, I know. You, you won't like this at all. Disregard every single metronome mark you ever see on any piece of music because they are misleading. Even if they're correct, even if they're good markings, Music is subjective. Music is about you, the student, or the teacher, or the pianist, playing that for you. You can't compare yourself to anyone else. I can't read half as fast as my wife can read. So I'm not, I, I would probably read this book at maybe, I don't know, 40 words per minute or something like that. 100 words per minute is too fast. And then to top that off, there's pictures. So, you know, if you, you saw this directions and you must look at all the pictures in less than one second time. So they give you all these rules at reading and looking at pictures. That's ridiculous. No one would ever do that for a book. So why do it in music? Why? Why do it in music? And why believe, why believe everything that you see on a page with a metronome art? I'd say, throw all that out the window play any speed you want, any speed that you think is musical, and that's good for you. How's that? All right. Well, uh, I'd like to see Mr. Winters do a little rebuttal to this video and see what he can come up with that can explain better than I've explained Bergmuller's crazy and problematic metronome marks. So thank you for joining me for this video, and until we meet again.